question. Um, the gentleman raised a concern about uh, consumers having problems as far as um, foreign insurance um, agency in our area. What protection does a consumer have um, if we have a foreign health insurer? None? I'm Jackie Cunningham, the Insurance Commissioner in Virginia. Um, to, to respond to your question, um, I believe that the consumer could theoretically um, request assistance from the state in, that, that did have uh, regulatory authority over the, over the product that was issued. I cannot speak with any certainty as to how much assistance they would receive from that state. It kind of depends on the laws they have in that state. to vote on electronic voting board. Chairman, um, 1984 um, came about from a, a, essentially a war that, uh, a corporate war that's uh, in, the, in the office above my my delegate office, and we had we've been talking about um, trying to make it a little easier to do business. Um, he had mentioned what they do in Delaware, and Nevada, and 14 other states, which is create of a series LLC. Um, and so what this legislation does is under one LLC, you would, so, back yeah, explain that. Yeah, okay, so it's backtrack. So um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in agriculture, so it'll be very easy to, to, to kind of describe how, if, if my operation was about four times larger than what I, than what I am now, so the substitute. But, so, essentially I would divide up in order to um, mitigate some liabilities, I would divide my corporation up into various LLCs. So each farm would have its own LLC, I'd have an LLC that does transportation, I'd have an LLC that does, um, that handles some of my grain um, shipping and, and things, and grain drying and that kind of thing, I'd have an LLC that's dedicated to cattle operation. Um, what this legislation does is it creates a single LLC and then I can assign those various um, liabilities into, a, into a, what's called a series. So I'd be, I'd be filing essentially one income statement, et cetera, but my liability would be created by, sorry. Let me, do I have a motion we adopt substitute? Uh, motion and second that we adopt substitute. All those in favor say aye. And then the um, the substitute 
um, and the amending language was brought by the Virginia Bar Association the Business Law Section to have it conform with the uh, uniform, some of the Uniform Law Commission updates. What's that? So that's that, but that's that's why the uh, the, the new language was, was necessary. So that's essentially what the bill does, or is designed to do. Um, so there, I, like I said. Uh, so uh, how many, I know this. This has been they've been working on this through the National Conference and Commission on Uniform Laws. I forget what the what you call that. It's uh, I, I forget. The Kuzel. They had not. This is a, the what what was what is before us is what they have come up with thus far. Question for council, that's all right. Question for council. So, Frank, I just, in layman's terms, am I essentially being able to silo liability in the different LLCs, but basically subsidiaries of one LLC in the same way? That's the idea. Uh, it's essentially, yes, by siloing liability. Um, just as you can have a corporation corporations, sure. those affiliates are treated as separate corporations with limitations on liability limited to their particular assets and liabilities. This is doing the same concept but for uh, LLCs. LLCs. So Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chair, follow up? Yes. So we are, what we're doing is essentially mimicking what corporations can do when we're applying it to LLCs. I think that's an accurate uh, right. with free top description. Thank you. Okay, so just to break down to something that I know um, in agriculture, if we were a little bit bigger where I would have, you know, 10 or 12 grain trucks, um, much bigger herd, etc., we would divide up those entities into different LLCs. So you'd have Locust Hill Farm Livestock LLC, you'd have Locust Hill Trucking LLC, you'd have um, what we still, and then each farm would be broken up just to mitigate those liabilities rather than being under one LLC. And then when you do that, you're filing separate for each separate LLC, you're doing income statements for each LLC, et cetera. And the idea was that we, if, if you created a series LLC, which they've done in Delaware, Nevada, and 14 other states, you would then just take those different entities and have them in their series and be filing one income statement, one LLC. But you could, could you do that now? Just a straight corporation, can you do all that now? But instead of an LLC, I would not know the answer to that question, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yeah, if, if I may, I, to counsel. So, if I heard counsel right, corporations can do theoretically what he's trying to do here. I think the idea is you'd have a, a separate corporation, a corporation that was established. Own subsidiary, Correct. wholly owned subsidiary. Yeah. Whether they have to have an accounting would be an accounting question. Correct. But as far as the liability, well, as far as the liability protection, they can already do that. LLCs can already do the liability piece. What are you saying? Corporations can. Corporations, but LLC cannot. 
Um, there's no mechanism now that I'm aware of where you have an LLC that would have a um, series of limited liability and then, entities within that. And then report as one. Right. That's correct. That's, that's, the, that's the key. Yeah, and, this, and so, the, Mr. Chair, if I may, there are some. This will allow a lot of tax optionality. Hey, bearing in mind that uh, we're talking about reporting and how they handle consolidated returns is something that's uh, outside of outside your scope. Understood. understood. Right. Delegate Key? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of questions. And uh, just to piggyback on what Delegate Farrell just said, yesterday he and I were in a finance subcommittee where similar issues came up about treating the taxes on LLCs to make it similar to corporations. And we talked about how there are so many different aspects of uh, LLCs and corporations that are treated similarly in some ways, different in other ways. And to the extent that we can make it consistent for tax purposes, we should also make it consistent for incorporation and other purposes as well. So I think this is a small piece of, of a larger conversation that's happening. And to the extent that we can make it happen, I'd, I'd be supportive. Just, I want to go back to your um, impact statement that refers to the, it says, the measure is based, your bill, the measure is based on the December 8th, 2016 draft of the Uniform LLC Protect, Protected Series Act prepared by the National Conference and Commissioners on U Uniform State Laws. Uh, I wanted to ask you about that. Is this something that's being worked on in other states based on the same uniform? Yes, sir. Um, from my knowledge, they're, they're actually continuing to work on this, you know, to have it be uniform. And there's 14 other states that have implemented this. Um, Delaware has had this implemented for a number of years since I've, in the 90s, I believe. Um, that's where our original draft language last year came from. And then the Virginia Bar Association said this is this is something that they're currently working on. And they, you know, we so we got we so this so the bill as it stands now is from the most recent draft of that. I think it was your just to follow up on that. So the uh, enactment clause of kicking this off till July 1st of 2018. Is that under the assumption that more changes will happen to through the national conference work process or the bar so that to the extent that we may have the concept in place in code but we may make more changes along the way? Because I, I mean, I'm, I'm supportive of the idea. I just wanna, I wonder if we're fixing in the code something that's not quite ready yet. So to the extent that we put something in with an enactment cause two years from now, a year and a half from now versus waiting until next year and then putting something that's more finalized. I, I, I can really can't speak for the, I guess the, the primary reason would be it would take some time for um, the entities involved, the agencies involved to upgrade their systems and things. Um, I guess the, uh, another good, I mean that would be a good good reason for the United Clause too, is if they made changes to make it more uniform. If, if, our, if our bar uh, association has been working on this uh, with the other uh, with the other folks? That's who gave us the Most of it is new. Most of it deals with the interplay and what rules apply, uh, in a sense, from other uh, portions of the LLC chapter and how that would apply to these series uh, LLCs. And it's mostly new language. It's not like it's been deleted somewhere. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. May I ask? So as long as we've got Frank talking, I mean, is, does it come from another state? I mean, is this? Or did we just someone just come up with all this? No, it, it, it comes from this uh, national well, conference. What happened, uh, as, as the patron mentioned, um, something conceptually similar to this was in this last year. Okay. That was based on the okay. This version is based on the uh, Methuselah model. Uh, Virginia's member of Methuselah and uh, a couple of model laws like the UCC, numerous laws. Uh, they're in the process of developing a uniform law that would be hopefully adapted by numerous states. Um, they're still working on it, and this is the most recent draft. 
Somebody has gone through it up here, and they can sort of walk us through line by line, and let's get to it. But this is a three or four hour project, and that's uh, I'm just suggesting that we send it to somebody. Civil sub is not done with their work, so it's not they just they got some bandwidth. And um, I'm just I would suggest that might be a right way to get this to review. And there's a, there's three or four of us all right. here that are on that. And I expect you to vote no, but the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, Mr. Chair, I would move that we send this over to the Courts of Justice. That this be transferred to the Courts of Justice Committee with the expectation of the same civil sub. You can make that much. I do. No, no expectation. Yeah. Just refer. So your motion is just to refer. Yes, sir. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. We had this come up with transportation this morning. They told us that we couldn't just refer unless it was an administrative request or something from the speaker that we had a report referred. I'll go get it. Does that make any sense? I'll go get it. Put it by for a couple of minutes. I'll go upstairs and get one. If that's a yeah. report. <laughs> yeah, it's administrative referrals only, right? Report and referred reports. Yeah. Okay. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'm willing to work on the bill wherever it goes. Okay. Um, so it's not whatever the will of the committee may be. Go by temporarily. Simple. Thank you. All right, delegate uh, Byron, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think a few of you have heard about this bill. It's, um, it's been a point of discussion um, since the, I think, before um, uh, we even got to session. But let me let me give you a little genesis um, on the bill. It's very important, at least for me, that I clear up some of the um, misunderstandings. Some of them were, um, I think, disingenuous. Um, but no matter what, they were out there, and I think that when we all come down here, we understand what it's like to be up at this podium and have a lot of information that is disseminated across the internet now that we don't always get an opportunity to, um, to actually realize that we all come down here in good faith to do something that's best for the people of the Commonwealth, and that we should be able to have civil um, public policy debates on issues and to be able to decide what's best. And as we do that, um, we discover sometimes, just as Alba did when he left a little while ago, that some things come to light that you didn't um, think before. Or we get into some really good discussions and we have compromises and discuss things that, um, that we're working on. So with that, I want to say that as a chair of the Broadband Advisory Council, I've been serving on that for seven years now um, with other members of this House and Senate. And our job is to advise the governor on access to broadband 
And as the last seven years have grown, we've also seen the demand grow and individuals that um, may be calling you a little bit more often now as they have become accustomed to all the things that seem to uh, become a necessity in their lives. So the intent of the original bill was to um, take the knowledge and the barriers and other items that have been discussed throughout the last few years. We've addressed some of them with poll attachment issues that you voted on, with some of the rights of way and other things that were barriers to deploying um, broadband and allowing us to have solutions that would um, address those needs of people in uh, areas that would require different types of technology. But there still are barriers that exist to get to those that are unserved. The General Assembly passed um, in their budget last year. We all voted for money that would, um, uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development is um, just getting ready to release to localities that are reaching unserved areas. And that speed that you saw in the first bill was based on the same definition and rules that they were using for those grants. So that's where the speed that became a controversial issue showed up in the bill. But the whole intent of the bill and what I think that I brought as a member of the advisory council, if, if you were to take the time, and I know we don't have time, so I'm going to um, give you the information now, to look at Are You Online, which comes from the, um, from the Virginia Broadband Com Campaign Report, says that the majority of broadband in Virginia and across the nation has been deployed because it was profitable for the private sector to deliver the service. In rural and less populated areas, the cost to deliver the service often exceeds the potential revenue. Leaders at all levels of government realize the necessity of broadband to support many aspects of life today. As we witness increased innovation and technological advancements, there is a gap between the internet service that every home and business would, should and would like to have and what was profitable to build. How we bridge the gap is the basis for continued work and focus. And that is exactly where I was coming from when I introduced the bill was trying to figure out how we're going to fill the gaps and prioritize service to the unserved areas of the Commonwealth. In the process of doing so, a lot of things that were going on throughout the Commonwealth with government-owned networks came to light, in particular in the Roanoke Valley. And that's where a lot of information started getting disseminated. Some of it, I would say, is not particularly as accurate as it could be um, as far as the information that entered um, on the internet to try and discourage folks, especially the comments that were made that I was particularly trying to stop the deployment of broadband in the state of Virginia, which is pretty ludicrous. Um, so I continued on and was not going to allow myself to be bullied because we're trying, all trying to accomplish that. So with all the different issues that we dealt with, I thought we had a bill that, um, that would do that. So what you have today is a substitute um, to address the objections and eliminate many of them that were made, objection after objection, to things in the bill that I don't agree that that's what they did, but they were there um, and being objected to, and it was just taking away from the, the, what the whole bill was trying to do. Um, in this instance, the substance clarifies, the substitute clarifies and strengthens the FOIA requirements related um, to the deployment of broadband. Um, it's designed to protect taxpayer funds and provide transparency to ensure accountability. Let me make it clear what the substitute does not do. It doesn't prevent local governments from entering into the marketplace. It doesn't require any approvals outside of the local governments involved in the business, so the burdens they refer to are no longer there. It doesn't set any speed standard, and it doesn't distinguish between served or unserved. That is a discussion that we continue to try to work on, unserved and unserved. You know, we have many people in our district, and there's always going to be a question about whether or not someone is getting the speed that they desire and want to have to do certain things, and then there's people that are sitting there totally in the dark, not able to get internet access at all. 
And what our goal has been is to try to find solutions working together to get to those unserved areas. Um, they apply the standards currently present in the Wireless Services Authority Act, and they incorporate recommendations contained in the state auditor's report of the Bristol Virginia Utility. The focus of this bill is to ensure that taxpayer resources are protected. There were important lessons that were learned with BVU. BVU is not an exception, and that was not what my bill was about when I put it in. When I put it in, I was trying to encompass all the things we discussed. Um, it was brought up in our committee because there was a lot of taxpayer loss. There was $80 million of taxpayer dollars lost with that situation. But they're not an exception. You know, as I've studied this more, there, it's happening in other states. And I'm not suggesting that it's happening in other counties in Virginia, but to ignore the report and the recommendations that came out any different than we would ignore other things that are brought to our attention that protect the taxpayers would be disingenuous of all of us. There are, there's a report called that was done by Widener University that mentions, I won't mention particular names, but in Georgia, $35 million network that was government owned that was sold for 11.2 million. Taxpayers lost on Vermont, $17 million in debt due to downgrading of their city's bond service. There's, there's, there's a lot more after that, and I can go on and on and tell you. I'm not saying everyone is, and we've got some localities that are doing it right, and I shared that in several different times that we've talked. The biggest controversy and misunderstanding has been the localities that thought this applied to what they were doing, but they weren't, they were owning a network, but they weren't servicing it. They weren't selling it out to the public, and it did not apply to them and still does not apply to them. But who pays for the shortfall when the government-operated networks fail? The taxpayer does. And that's who this bill was intended to protect. The taxpayer can choose a provider, and if private provider goes under, they're not sitting there holding the debt for it. But as a taxpayer, if the government fails, then they're the ones that have to recoup. The teachers, the, the fire departments, everyone else that are a part of what that government um, is responsible for funding. So the focus on this bill, what's left of it, is to continue with the oversight and the transparency. I think when you're spending taxpayer dollars that we need to have sunshine. That is what we talk about all the time. And there were important lessons that we learned and I think that this bill will prevent us from repeating the losses that were incurred by the taxpayers. Mr. Chairman, I know that um, <coughs> Everyone's been receiving a lot of mail. I still think that there are some valid points that I just mentioned that will protect the taxpayers and afford sunshine. So I'm going to request. Delegate Hugo wants to say one something. Now, Miss. Uh, Miss Hugo, you have to be Okay, go ahead. I was going to request, um, with the committee's concurrence, that I have a couple localities. I'm still working with um, Virginia Beach as an amendment that. Um, that we're working on, and I would ask that you would um, take it by for the day so we can um, continue to work out those that have actually come to me and asked me to make some changes to the bill. I have a question, Dr. Byron. We have two days left. I have the 31st, which is Energy Day, and then I have the last day, which is uh, the 2nd. Do you have a preference? The 2nd would be fine. All right. The 2nd it is. So, you know, with Delegate Byron brought before the substitute. This is what we're going to be working off of on the second. When is the 31st? I don't even know what's the 31st is. is Tuesday. The second is Thursday. It really doesn't week matter. Tuesday. Whatever the, okay. the chairman would. That, that's fine, but we'll be working off this, this, this substitute. And um, those of y'all who uh, would wish to talk about uh, the substitute, uh, I'm sure that Delegate Byron will get together a group to try to sit down. I would welcome anyone to come to my door. Uh, work on this, so this will be, uh, we'll put this off till uh, the second, uh, and good luck with the process. Thank you. Bye. Uh, uh,
think I've got the last bill. Substitute for 1542. House Bill 1542. We have a motion to accept the substitute. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, what House Bill 1542 uh, uh, does, uh, Madam Chairwoman, is shifts the responsibility from uh, regulating home service contract providers from the State Corporation Commission. Uh, to the Commissioner uh, for the Department of Agriculture and Consumer uh, uh, Services. Uh, uh, it provides that home service contracts are, are not uh, contracts of insurance and are not subject to the uh, uh, Commonwealth Insurance Law, but they are agreements, what home service agreements are, are agreements to, uh, for repair, service repair, replacement, uh, component parts, uh, uh, with regard to like component parts on appliances and things of that uh, nature. Uh, they're going to be required to register with the commissioner, and uh, they will be uh, provide, required to uh, maintain a funded reserve account for their obligations uh, under the contracts, and uh, they will come, I believe they come under the uh, Consumer uh, Protection Plan under uh, uh, Online 315 uh, of the uh, substitute. But uh, we have uh, worked uh, through this process and uh, worked with uh, both the State Corporation Commission and the uh, Department of uh, Agriculture and Commun uh, Consumer Services uh, to uh, uh, go through the process as it, re as it relates to uh, uh, bonds and letters of credit, registration fees, and uh, 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 what, uh, uh, you know, how they would uh, be invested, how the commissioner would investigate and how they would uh, produce records and things of that nature. But the goal is, is to shift them over, over to where uh, already there's extended service contracts in the Department of Agriculture, so they already have experience with that, and to shift them from the uh, State Corporation Commission. So that's the reason uh, for the shift. I do have uh, someone to testify. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, Madam Chairman, Madam Benedetti representing the National Home Service Contract Association. And just as the patron said, the, the reason for this bill is taking these products, which are not insurance, out of the Bureau of Insurance, putting them over into the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services with a similar product, not the same, but similar product for the extended services contracts. Um, there are protections in the bill uh, for new companies coming in. We are ex we experienced with the original bill, the reason for the substitute, there was a fiscal impact uh, the amount of money collected on premium taxes over the Bureau was not equal to what the income tax would be for these companies if they moved. We have added language provided by the Department of Tax, which makes the bill revenue neutral. Uh, it's, it's a minimum tax based on the income tax. It's at the same rate that they would be, these companies were being charged for the premium tax, so that, that effect is zero. Uh, the other fiscal impacts... Taxes here, they said. Taxes here. Uh, the other fiscal impact was VDAX had indicated they would need full-time employee to handle any new companies that were to come into the industry. Um, we have attempted to fix that problem with two ways. One is we've added an enacted clause to delay it until January, which should have cut that number in half. In addition, we required or we made the registration process uh, for only new companies coming in, meaning the current companies that have been with the Bureau for the last 10 years, the 12 companies, would have been thoroughly vetted zero complaints over the last 10 years. Um, they are not to be required uh, to do anything with VDAX. So, except for to pay that minimum tax to make the bill revenue neutral. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the bill. Delegate Ware. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could you just tell me in layman's terms, 
what, what are we talking about with the home service contract? What, what, what is the what is the product? Right. Yeah. So if you were to buy a house and your realtor were to put a home service contract or a home warranty, which is often referred to, we don't like the term warranty because it infers insurance because we're not an insurance product, but it covers your appliances. So if you're, the house you were buying, the washing machine went bad, then this product would send over a repairman to either repair it or replace it, and that's what it does. It's an annually renewable product, um, so, and that's essentially what it's in. And other systems in the house, including HVAC, um, dishwasher, that sort of thing. So, so it's a contract, not insurance. That's correct. That's and so there's specified elements of the home that are covered under this contract, not the entirety. That's correct. And further, we're moving this from VDAX to the commissioner commission. By the way, we're moving it from the Bureau of Insurance over to VDAX. The other product that I think you're referring to that covers the entire house, including structure, is the home protection. What is it called? Home protection. Home protection insurance, which covers structure. <coughs> it's just appliances. It's not structure. So the reason we were in that code section now, we were Article Two of that code section, is because it sounded the same. But since we're not insurance, it actually states in that section of the code that we're in right now that we're not insurance. So it just it seemed appropriate to move it over to a more similar product or category in the code that the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services already deals with. So looking at the language and checking out what my friend uh, Delegate Bell mentioned in an earlier bill, there's a lot of new pages in here. Yes. Are they principally a movement from one place to another? Uh, the first part, the long part, basically cleans up that code section of Article 1 in the Bureau Code that references the code that we're getting rid of, the section that we're getting rid of. So that's, that's a cleanup section. After that would be the language from the department. Well, I, actually, I think after that, page 12, 13, page 13. 13 is where you start. Yeah, from page 13 all is language from the, uh, would be language from the uh, department to make sure that, uh, that we, change in their, where they are in the tax code? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, it would be a, a change. Where they are now, they're paying insurance premium tax. It's, it's a gross receipts tax or gross premium at two and a quarter percent. Uh, once you take them out of that, they would automatically make them subject to the corporate income tax. Uh, and because the corporate income tax is net, even with a higher rate, we were concerned that it would not be revenue neutral. So very similar to what happened with the telephone companies when they were moved from gross receipts tax to a corporate income tax, the electric utilities when they were moved uh, from a, a gross receipts tax to a corporate income tax to ensure there would be no revenue loss, there's a minimum tax imposed would be the greater, they would, they would pay either the greater corporate income tax or a minimum tax would be equal to what they used to pay under the insurance premium tax. So that makes it revenue neutral. And you have my next question, you have confidence that this will end up revenue neutral? Mr. Chairman, as far as we can tell, it, it, it says that they will pay an amount of what they really used to pay, so uh, pretty close. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Mr. Beaver? Yeah, I just had a, a couple of questions, and I'm not sure if the chairman or for somebody else. And just, I'm sure they're all just clarifying questions, but it's, if a 
be okay. Um, there's an investigation section under here where the commissioner has certain powers, issue subpoenas, and that kind of stuff, and I ask the commissioner to be that. Just want to make sure that the way we've laid out those investigations is, is what they can already do in other analogous situations, not create new subpoena power or anything like that. provision and a subpoena provision and that type of thing. They said, I'm looking at line 456, I'm on. Sorry about that. Uh, Larry Nichols, Department of Agriculture. You're looking on 456? Yeah, just looking at the investigation section and making sure that's all consistent with your existing powers and your procedures for performing similar investigations. Yeah, yeah just reading it very briefly, I think it is. Okay. We have chari charitable gain. And many you can issue subpoenas through the commissioner, can issue through the commission and all that. Well, many, t many times if it's something that's a violation of the Consumer Pro uh, uh, Protection Act, we would go through the Attorney General's office in those situations. Yeah, well, so that was actually going to be my next set of questions. So this is also incorporated in the Virginia Consumer Protection Act. So it looks to me like you can do a separate investigation and there's a way to do that. But you could also pursue a Consumer Protection Act claim, as I read it in here. The only con question I had there was, and we talked about this a little bit with the roofing bill we did the other day. Consumer Protection Act claims in Virginia all predicate upon a fraud standard. Are there any ways someone could violate this new language in something less than fraud, but which would be pulled into the Consumer Protection Act? I think there would be ways that you could violate it in something less than fraud. Right. Uh, obviously, it could be an act of uh, 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 you know just a, a particular. Uh, Maybe you're not living up to your contractual agreements, and maybe if you're doing it as a, uh, you know, maybe there's four or five uh, uh, complaints against you, and I think they could, I think they would be able to investigate or institute an investigation on that particular, uh, those complaints. I think that would be one way. I don't know if any other examples. There's probably I, other examples. I mean, if we case. just, if we just had what would be normally considered a breach of contract claim when you bought a home service right. contract and they did a poor job of fulfilling it, are we making a traditional basic breach of contract claim into a Consumer Protection Act claim with all the extra remedies? I, I don't think so because I think to, uh, to uh, prove the other, I think it's a higher standard, isn't it? Don't know if on the consumer uh, protection. Well, some of them are written differently. This yeah. one just, it, this is in the words, this is a list of a violation of any of these chapters is Consumer Protection a violation of Consumer Protection right. Act, and most of those are kind of consumer protection-y statutes. Right. And I'm not, I don't have a problem with it. We've had this conversation with a few other provisions, and I, I, we have tried to limit the Consumer Protection Act to fraud claims, so right. maybe if someone could take a look at that, and in theory, down the road, maybe want to add a word that says, okay. you know, a knowing violation of the section, or a fraudulent violation of the section, or something like that. We can do that. Something to consider. And then, the only other random question I had, Madam Chairwoman, and I was, I think Delegate Bell answered it for me, but there's a criminal provision in here that creates a crime for a provider. And I'm reading it, and I envision the provider being an entity as much as an individual. And I just am not familiar in state law how we handle crimes against companies. Um, has anybody charged a company? I think it's a non-jailable misdemeanor offense right. it's in here, so it would essentially be a criminal fine against the company. Right. And you hear about that more at the federal level, and I just wasn't sure if we did that at the state level. The class three misdemeanor, I don't know, Bell may know, but it's a, yeah, it's not jailable. Non-jailable up yeah. to 500. And I just want to make sure that we do that, that we have crimes against right. companies. You can, you, can, you can file a crime against a company. There are people, or considered people. Thank you. Those are my two questions. Madam Chair. Yes, Delegate King. I, I was just wondering if uh, Doug Gray has an opinion on whether these are insurance products or not. No, I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. All right. I say, Madam Chair. I don't see any more questions. Do we have anyone that wants to speak in support of this bill? Madam Chair, Katie Payne with Williams Mullen on behalf of the Service Contract Industry Council, which has both service contract providers and extended service contract providers. The latter is already at VDAS, and so we think it makes sense to move both these products over there for consistency. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone? Anyone in opposition to the bill? Got a motion?
motion to report that's been seconded. All in favor, get ready to vote on the voting machine. Take care of House Bill 1984, Delegate Weberts. I uh, need a motion to s refer that to courts. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Chair, so apparently it happens administratively, and uh, we made a request that it will be, it's just been transferred. The clerks over. tell me we need to just say yes. Let's okay. give it a blessing and say yes. All in favor of referring to court, say aye. 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 Thank you. Captain Doug and Yancey. Just Mr. Madam Chair, before we before we dismiss, I just wanted to make a quick announcement to the members of the committee. Uh, you should receive or will soon be receiving a document from Hampton University in regards to House Bill 1656. And I just wanted to bring the members' attention. Regretfully, I for some unknown reason thought the bill was going to be up today to be on February the 2nd. But we do have representatives here from Hampton and the Proton Center Therapy. If members have any questions, they'd be happy to entertain those. Okay. Madam Chair. Um, I just uh, quickly to save time in the subcommittee, um, because of the chairman's willingness to study the internet loans, um, I'd love to lay my House Bill 1443 on the table. Okay, we have a motion to lay 14 1443 on the table. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any others? Thank you. Okay. Committee's adjourned, and the subcommittee um, immediately thereafter will be in about, well, won't be immediately, let's say five minutes.